Uh, 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 no. You're asking me? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, hmm. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't really know. Um, uh, democracy. 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 A democracy. A democracy. <laughs> I have no idea. Democracy. 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 Democracy, yeah. What, what form? Uh, what form of government do we have in the United States? What form of government do we have in the United States? We have a democracy. Democracy. Democracy? Uh, um, democracy? Democracy. Would I be surprised to find that we don't have a democracy? Yes. No. Yes. Well, yeah, I would be surprised. I would be very surprised. Ooh, when was the last time I said the pledge? Hmm. When's the last time I said the Pledge of Allegiance? About eight years ago. Oh, probably a year ago. Probably 21 years ago. Do I remember the words? I think I did. I pledge, pledge, of pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States of America. And to the public. For which it stands. To and to the what? The public. And to the what? Republic. 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 The Republic. That's right. And we are a republic. Uh -huh. Republic. Republic. Oh, the republic. The difference. What is the difference between a democracy and a republic? What is the difference between a republic and a democracy? I can't remember the spell. Jeez, that's a good question. Don't know the answer. Oh, good lord. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you got me there. I don't know the answer to that. Hello, I'm Gordon Phillips. You know the truth is a funny thing. You can distort it, you can even suppress it for a while. Sometimes you discover that it's hiding in plain view all along. But eventually, the truth always comes out. The problem with the truth is that once you learn it, you can't unlearn it. Winston Churchill once said, most people sometime in their lives stumble across truth. Most jump up, brush themselves off, and hurry on about their business as if nothing had happened. What you are about to learn will lead you into areas you may never have been before. If you're a person who has always believed everything your government tells you, then this tape will very likely forever change the way you view your government. If you would rather not learn the truth in order to not have to hold yourself accountable for knowing it, or have to deal with the consequences of putting it into action, or have to deal with your conscience should you decide to ignore the truth, then perhaps you should stop this tape right now, rewind it, and pass it along to someone else to listen to. So let's get started. I'll be covering three broad areas. The first is the symbiotic relationship between our banking system and the income tax and is crucial to your understanding of the real reason why we even have an income tax. The second area will cover the surprisingly limited authority of the federal government to tax the citizen of the 50 states of the Union. And the third area will discuss the solution. I'll introduce you to a patriotic organization of thousands of members nationwide who have learned to free themselves from a lifetime of Pavlovian conditioning and bondage to the IRS through the fear that stems from ignorance of the written law. According to Internal Revenue Manual, Chapter 1100, Section 1111.1, titled Mission, The purpose of the IRS is to encourage and achieve the highest possible degree of voluntary compliance in accordance with the tax laws and regulations. IRS Publication 1, titled Your Rights as a Taxpayer, states, 
As a taxpayer, you have the right to be treated fairly, professionally, promptly, and courteously by Internal Revenue Service employees. Our goal at the IRS is to protect your rights so that you will have the highest confidence in the integrity, efficiency, and fairness of our tax system. Well, what do you think? Do you have the highest degree of public confidence in the integrity, efficiency, and fairness of the IRS? Are you treated fairly, professionally, promptly, and courteously by IRS employees? And what exactly does voluntary compliance really mean? Mortimer Kaplan, former IRS commissioner, stated in the 1975 Internal Revenue Audit Manual, Our tax system is based on individual self-assessment and voluntary compliance. Meaning, assess yourself and volunteer to comply, or we'll seize your property and you may go to jail. For years, the IRS has ruled the American people in a manner many feel is equal only to the Soviet KGB. Fear, bluff, and deception have been the IRS major weapons. Once it has targeted its victims for audit, investigation, assessment, and seizure, the IRS will try to take three things away from them, their money, their time, and their reputation. Yet IRS Commissioner Margaret Milner Richardson, in her Dear Taxpayer preface to the 1994 Form 1040 Instruction Workbook, stated, and I quote, I want you to know that the S in IRS represents a commitment to serve you. Now isn't that heartwarming? It reminds me of the Twilight Zone episode in which apparently benevolent aliens land on Earth and donate a book to mankind titled To Serve Man. When translated, it turns out to be a cookbook. Ms. Richardson goes on to list under customer service standards. Our goal is to answer your questions accurately. Well, that certainly came as news to me, considering that the IRS will readily admit that it takes no responsibility for the accuracy of the information given out over the phone by its personnel to members of the public who call to get their questions answered. Of the many people I know, including myself, who have ever written a simple question such as, Dear IRS, could you please cite for me the code section requiring a citizen working within the 50 states to file an income tax return? To this date, not a single one of us has ever received a single answer, let alone an accurate answer. The IRS simply ignores all such letters. So much for the S in service. So much for being treated fairly, professionally, promptly, and courteously. So much for protecting our rights. Quoting from IRS in Action, former IRS criminal investigation agent Santo Presti reveals, Given the opportunity, the IRS will take the easy way out and grab whatever it can. The IRS does not really care about you or what your future may be. If the IRS does decide to investigate you, it will interview your friends, family, business associates, clients, and customers, and turn them into informants, paid informants. So did Shirley tell the truth? Apparently not. Former IRS commissioner and former head of the Tax Crime Division at the Department of Justice, Shirley Peterson, stated in a lecture on April 14, 1993, at Southern Methodist University, Eight decades of amendments to the code have produced a virtually impenetrable maze. The rules are unintelligible to most citizens. The rules are equally mysterious to many government employees who are charged with administering and enforcing the law. The IRS depends not only upon its highly publicized actions, but upon its perceived power in order to instill fear into honest Americans, and to quote the agency itself, to maintain a sense of presence. Again quoting from IRS in Action, Santo Presti writes, Fear is the key element for the IRS in achieving its mission. Without fear, the IRS would have a difficult time maintaining our so-called system of voluntary compliance. Yet Internal Revenue Service Manual Section 5221 returns compliance programs, cautions IRS agents. Some techniques can be used only in connection with a full-scale program due to the nature of the tax situation and the need to avoid unnecessary taxpayer reaction. An example would be income tax returns compliance efforts aimed at the non-business taxpayer. Now what do you suppose they meant by that statement? Isn't the non-business taxpayer the individual citizen? Isn't that you? Could the unnecessary taxpayer reaction which they wish to avoid be due to the fact that the nature of the tax situation doesn't apply to the non-business citizen and that if the IRS pushes too hard, there may be a taxpayer reaction? 
While the typical American panics at the thought of being called in for an audit, did you know that for years the IRS itself steadfastly refused to be audited? And that when the IRS finally was audited for the first time ever in 1993, Comptroller Bauscher of the General Accounting Office testified before Congress that the IRS in its annual report to Congress had been knowingly exaggerating the amount of money it claimed to be able to collect by over $86 billion? Would you believe that when asked to explain this mind-boggling discrepancy, the GAO stated, and I quote, This audit was made extremely difficult because IRS's existing systems were not designed to provide reliable financial information on their operations. Now is that an excuse the IRS will allow you at an audit? Can you imagine telling an IRS auditor that your systems were not designed to provide reliable financial information on my operations? The IRS has actually now flunked audits by the General Accounting Office for four years in a row. Today Americans are led to believe that it's their patriotic duty to pay a third or more of their earnings to the IRS and that there's no alternative to the IRS chronic abuse. But is this really the truth? Is it possible that the authority of the IRS under the law could actually be quite limited? Could the IRS actually just be like the little man of whom it is said, pay no attention to the little man behind the curtain? You might be interested to note that former Senator Henry Bellman stated in 1969, in a recent conversation with an official at the Internal Revenue Service, I was amazed when he told me, quote, if the taxpayers of this country ever discover that the IRS operates on 90% bluff, the entire system will collapse. Would it surprise you to learn that the authority given to Congress under the Constitution to tax a citizen of the 50 states is really very limited? And that the authority that Congress then gave the IRS is equally limited? And that the authority the IRS then delegated to its own agents is no less limited? Would you be interested in learning more and perhaps seeing these laws and regulations for yourself? Before I continue, allow me to state that I am not a licensed attorney. I am also not a licensed certified public accountant or an enrolled agent licensed to practice before the IRS. I therefore cannot and will not be giving you any legal accounting or tax advice whatsoever. I cannot and will not advise you as to any requirement you may or may not have under the law to file any particular return or to pay any particular tax. If you need such legal or tax advice, please seek the services of competent, licensed tax professionals, assuming, of course, that any can be found. Just because I cannot practice law does not mean that I cannot show you the law. No U.S. citizen needs a license simply to read the law and compare his or her understanding of the written law with a fellow citizen. You and I can open a law book and read together what Congress wrote to see what the written law actually states. After all, isn't that what a jury of 12 of our fellow citizens does when considering whether a defendant violated a particular law? As a citizen, I simply insist that everyone, including officials of the government, obey the law as it is written. We've already discussed the fact that we are a constitutional republic and not a democracy. And indeed, most adult Americans living today started out each school day as young children by pledging allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. Can you imagine pledging and to the democracy for which it stands? President Clinton and most of our elected politicians keep referring to America as a democracy. No doubt this is because they weren't taught the difference under government-funded, outcome-based public education and their parents and teachers probably weren't taught the difference either. The founders knew the difference, however. James Madison warned, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Samuel Adams stated, Democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes itself, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. As Benjamin Franklin emerged from Independence Hall in Philadelphia, he was asked by an onlooker what form of government he and his countrymen had created during the first, and to date, only constitutional convention. His answer? A republic, if you can keep it. 
the founders understood that there is a spectrum of liberty that spans a gradient from anarchy, which is 0% government and 100% liberty, to totalitarianism, which is 100% government and 0% liberty. A constitutional republic with restrictions that properly limit the power of the government will provide for the protection of life and property. Just enough government and no more to protect one's God-given rights. Good government is based on the collective right of self-defense, where each citizen is in the law enforcement business and stands as an armed shield against government tyranny. Our founders designed America as a constitutional republic under the rule of written law, not a democracy under the rule of opinion or public policy guidelines. The two forms of government are separated by a vast ocean of difference. As students of history, the founders knew that democracies always degenerate into favoritism, special interest groups, mob rule, and ultimately tyranny due to a majority of the uninformed public consistently and predictably voting to re-elect those politicians who would guarantee them the redistribution of public wealth. The founders knew that a republic protects minority individuals against a malicious and willful majority. A perfect, if somewhat cynical, definition of a democracy is two ravenous wolves and one sheep voting on what to have for breakfast. Explaining the disaster that a democracy can become, Karl Marx, known as the father of communism and himself a student of political science, once stated, Democracy is a form of government that cannot long survive. For as soon as the people learn that they have a voice in the fiscal policies of the government, they will move to vote for themselves all the money in the treasury and bankrupt the nation. A constitutional republic, on the other hand, vigilantly guarded by an informed and enlightened electorate and represented not by politicians, but by statesmen who would tirelessly defend liberty and property stands a fighting chance of not deteriorating into a democracy. Remember this the next time a TV newsreader extols the virtue of the recent imposition of democracy in some emerging nation, or a public figure wants to pick your pocket to make the world safe for democracy. Under a democracy, one can appear to be free, but can never truly be at liberty as under a republic. Under a democracy, we apparently need bureaucratic swarms of self-anointed responsibility consultants to decide what is in the public's best interest to view, inhale, ingest, inject, etc. In the Constitution and its first ten amendments known collectively as the Bill of Rights, which remain to this very day the highest ruling law of the land, the founders wrote down the restricted powers which we the people grant to government to guarantee the protection of our God-given rights to liberty, freedom, and justice. Thomas Jefferson warned, In questions of power, then let no more be said of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Yet most Americans living today know more about sports scores, the O.J. Simpson trial, Oprah's latest struggles with weight loss, and the sex life of Michael Jackson than they do about their constitutionally protected rights. They can't even name them, let alone understand them well enough to even attempt to assert them. The founders knew that an informed, educated citizenry was the only real safeguard of liberty. They understood that every American must take personal responsibility for his or her own actions according to a clear understanding of the written law. This is one of the reasons why you and only you can decide whether or not you are liable for federal and state income tax. Most Americans living today, especially those educated in government schools, some still call them public schools, do not understand that the powers given to our government are specific, limited, and enumerated, and must be written out and clearly understood by all so that we can know how to conduct ourselves as well as know how the government must conduct itself. For example, does the Constitution give unlimited power to the Congress, the President, or the Supreme Court? Can these branches of government do anything they please unless the Constitution says that they cannot do it? The answer is no. The Constitution spells out the limits of the government's authority. If the conduct of the President, the Congress, and the Supreme Court is not specifically stated, then they cannot lawfully engage in that conduct. With this in mind, are domestic aid programs such as federal food stamps, clothing allowances, school education vouchers, 
and subsidize housing constitutional? No. All federal aid programs are unconstitutional, since the only actions that can be taken by the government are those for the general welfare of the entire United States, meaning for all of us, for you and me, for our kids and our grandparents, for our friends down the street, for everyone. They too have a right to benefit from the general welfare activities of the United States. But to give specific treatment and benefits to a select group of people is not provided for in the Constitution. It's important to understand that the common understanding of man cannot be applied to the law. The Supreme Court stated in the case U.S. versus Minker, Because of what appears to be a lawful command on the surface, many citizens, because of their respect for what appears to be law, are cunningly coerced into waiving their rights due to ignorance. In our constitutional republic, rights cannot be taxed, but privileges can be which is why there is freedom in understanding your actual legal liabilities and legal requirements under the written law. Remember, it's not always what you don't know that can hurt you the most, but what you know that just isn't so. It's a long-established principle under federally recognized standards of statutory construction that the law is written in plain English to mean exactly what the words say. The written law is not to be interpreted through inference or implication in any way whatsoever. Consider the following statements. One, America was founded as a constitutional republic. Two, all law in a republic is written law. Three, the legislature presumably understands the English language. Four, the intent of the law is the force of the law. Five, the words in the law mean exactly what they say. Six. The law is not subject to interpretation or inference. 7. Any law which cannot be understood by any person of average intelligence is void for vagueness. And 8. A specific court action or trial applies to the litigants in that case only. Now ask yourself this simple, logical, and reasonable question. If the above statements are all true, and they are, then why is there case law at all? Could it be because our finest legal institutions have been churning out generations of lawyers and judges who don't understand English, or our form of government, or the law itself, or all of the above? If our legal system actually understood the above, there would be no case law. When someone asks me what my position is on a particular law, I explain, I don't have a position. I simply read the words and see what the law itself actually says. As a friend is fond of saying, if you find yourself starting to read something into the law that just isn't there, get a 12-year-old to read it to you, because they aren't sophisticated enough yet to try to interpret it. They'll just read it verbatim and tell you what it says. As the Supreme Court stated in the 1897 case U.S. v. Goldberg regarding the federal rules governing statutory construction, the intent of the lawmaker is to be found in the language that he has used. Congress complied and wrote the income taxing statutes in plain English to be readily understood by any person of average intelligence. If you were to read them for yourself, I'm confident that it would be perfectly clear to you to whom they apply. And haven't you always assumed they apply to you? Isn't that what everyone assumes? Otherwise, why would anyone be paying an income tax? For reasons you'll soon learn, and which I predict will totally amaze you, what Congress actually wrote into the law is the exact opposite of what you've been told. Now does your former misunderstanding of the distinction between a democracy and a republic start to ring a bell? My personal research over the past several years into the true limited application of the income tax laws and their widespread misapplication led me on a personal journey via telephone, fax, and mail from coast to coast investigating groups and organizations that claimed to assist the public in standing up for and asserting their rights under the law when dealing with the IRS. Every one of these organizations left me feeling uneasy, either as to what appeared to me to be off-point views, illogical arguments, or untested theories about the law, or as to what support they could provide me if I followed their program and methodology. Over and over again, I kept hearing the name of the Save a Patriot Fellowship being mentioned and always with the highest respect. 
For example, the following is an excerpt from an article written by Dr. Martin Larson, the highly respected constitutionalist and author, who wrote, Of all the analysis of the tax laws that have fallen into my hands, I believe the best one is a newsletter called Reasonable Action, published by the Save a Patriot Fellowship. Webster's Dictionary defines a fellowship as a mutual association of persons on equal and friendly terms, an association. I purchased the fellowship's first video, which was six hours long, entitled Evidence That Demands Action. What impressed me most was the fact that the video presentation took no position on the law, but simply showed what the law actually says and explained it to the viewer. It became clear to me that through many years of diligent research and analysis, the fellowship's dedicated scholars and paralegals had revealed the surprisingly limited authority of the IRS to tax American citizens. I called their Westminster, Maryland headquarters looking for advice in my particular situation and was told they couldn't provide me with any, not because I wasn't a member, but because they never gave legal or tax advice to anyone. They explained that I was the only person who could determine whether I had a requirement to file a particular return or a liability to pay a particular tax, and that all they could do was to tell me what the law says with regards to me. That made sense to me, and it really got my attention. In the spring of 1995, I traveled to Maryland to visit the Fellowship's national headquarters and spend some time with their staff. When I realized how quickly the Fellowship was growing and understood the value of the education and support they offered, I returned home, joined as a member, and began ordering and studying the materials they had been making available since opening their doors in 1984. A few months later, I requested and received the independent representative's examination in the mail, passed it, signed the policy agreement whereby I agreed not to misrepresent the law, and thereby became qualified to enroll new members. This opportunity has been truly phenomenal in empowering me to directly and immediately help so many fellow Americans being subjected to liens, levies, and collection activities and otherwise under assault by the IRS. The fellowship today consists of like-minded Americans from every single state of the Union, from Alaska to Florida, from California to Maine, and from every state in between. Each member is committed to returning the government to the constitutionally limited role the founders intended for it. Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks about a paradigm as the filter through which you perceive the world based upon your knowledge and experience. In Lewis Carroll's story, Alice stepped through the mirror and into the looking glass world, where everything looked the same but somehow different because she had shifted her paradigm. I think that I now have a lot in common with Alice because I've entered a new world of freedom where nearly everything I was taught my entire adult life by the government and the media about social security and the federal income tax turned out to be false. My parents and teachers didn't know because no one taught them either. The truth is indeed stranger than popular misconception. It has been observed many times throughout history that all newly discovered facts that fly in the face of the popular mindset go through three phases of scrutiny. One, the first phase is scorn and ridicule, heaped upon the messenger who delivers the new information. The second phase is skeptical, if begrudging analysis of the new information. And the third phase is universal acceptance, often expressed as, we knew it all along. Just ask Galileo, who proved the Earth is not the center of the universe, or Christopher Columbus, who later proved it isn't flat either. Americans in the 20th century have been led to believe that everyone is liable for the income tax, whether they like paying it or not, and that if everyone stopped paying their fair share, the government would go broke and collapse virtually overnight after jailing everyone first. But did you know that the majority of the revenues collected by the IRS today do not come specifically from income taxes? Where do the income taxes that are collected actually go? In 1982, President Ronald Reagan formed the President's Private Sector Survey on Cost Control, an independent panel of 160 of the country's top business leaders headed by Peter Grace and known as the Grace Commission in order to find ways to cut federal spending. In their report submitted to President Reagan on January 15, 1984, this commission stated the following. 100% of what is collected is absorbed solely by interest on the federal debt. 
all individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on the services taxpayers expect from government. This private blue ribbon panel reported that not one dollar of personal income tax collected by the IRS goes to pay for government services, but actually goes to pay the interest on our debt to the Federal Reserve. Now, does that shock and astonish you? And why does there need to be any debt owed to anyone just to create our money supply? Since most Americans have no clue as to who those parties actually are behind the creation and control of our inflationary debt-based money, they don't understand that the taxes they pay indirectly fuel the very inflation that Congress always uses as the excuse for higher and higher taxes. They're also completely unaware that the graduated income tax we have in America today is the second plank in the ten-plank Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx in 1848 as the very blueprint for socialism. T. Coleman Andrews, former Commissioner of Internal Revenue, understood this perfectly as exemplified in the following quote printed in the May 25, 1956 issue of U.S. News and World Report. I don't like the income tax. Every time we talk about these taxes, we get around to the idea of from each according to his capacity and to each according to his needs. That's socialism. It's written into the Communist Manifesto. Maybe we ought to see that every person who gets a tax return receives a copy of the Communist Manifesto with it so he can see what's happening to him. Norman Thomas, for many years the U.S. socialist presidential candidate, once stated, the American people will never knowingly adopt socialism, but under the name of liberalism, they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until one day America will be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. If you place a frog in a pan of water and slowly heat it, the frog will be cooked to death without ever knowing what happened. But drop that same frog into a pan of boiling water and it will jump right out. Several generations of Americans have been made drowsy in a pot of slowly warming socialism, masquerading as liberalism, and are now nearly fast asleep. I believe it was the former premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, who stated that communism was merely socialism in a hurry. A 1983 study by the Joint Economic Committee of Congress indicated that the top 1% of the U.S. population owned more than a third of the entire country's wealth. Most Americans today are unaware that inflation and the compounding of our massive federal debt are not normal and natural processes in a free market economy. And they don't realize that the income tax was a necessary control in order for socialistic wealth redistribution to be implemented right here in America through liberal spending schemes. Author George Bernard Shaw perhaps summed it up best when he said, Socialism means equality of income or nothing. Under socialism, you would not be allowed to be poor. You would be forcibly fed, clothed, lodged, taught, and employed, whether you like it or not. If it were discovered that you had not character enough to be worth all this trouble, you might possibly be executed in a kindly manner. But whilst you were permitted to live, you would have to live well. Interestingly, in 1848, the very same year that Karl Marx penned his Communist Manifesto, French author Frederick Bastiat wrote in his now famous essay titled The Law the following words. The war against illegal plunder has been fought since the beginning of the world. But how is legal plunder to be identified? Quite simply, see if the law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives it to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. Then abolish this law without delay. If such a law is not abolished immediately, it will spread, multiply, and develop into a system. The growth of the federal debt since 1787 looks just like a hockey stick. There was very little growth across the blade of the stick for nearly 200 years until the early 1980s. Then the debt starts to rocket straight up the handle. On a spring 1995 drive through Manhattan, I spotted an electronic billboard near Times Square displaying the accumulating federal debt. This billboard has 13 columns. In the first column was the digit 4, for 4 trillion. 
The remaining 12 digits showed billions, millions, hundreds of thousands, and finally hundreds, tens, and ones. I sat in traffic staring in fascination as the ones, tens, and hundreds spun so fast they were a total blur. The thousands column was going up by about $2,000 every second. As I sat through a single 60-second light cycle, the federal debt increased by approximately $117,000. On October 30th, 1995, Robert Rubin, Secretary of the Treasury, was seen on television asking Congress to raise the debt ceiling by $100 billion from $4.9 trillion to $5 trillion. On March 28, 1996, the House of Representatives voted to raise the ceiling on the national debt another $600 billion to $5.5 trillion. Sounds grim, doesn't it? But it's not the whole story by far. The National Taxpayers Union reported in 1991 that when all government liabilities are taken into account, both funded and unfunded, including loans to foreign countries that probably never will be repaid, such as the recent $50 billion bailout loan to Mexico, the actual total debt of the federal government was close to $17 trillion. That's 17 followed by 12 zeros, meaning that every baby born in the United States in 1991 began life already owing a greater than $65,000 personal share of the government debt. And that was back in 1991. It's now 1996. Does this concern you? Do you have children or grandchildren? And what do you think each share of that newborn debt burden has risen to today? Did you know that for over its first one and a quarter centuries under a hard money system backed by gold and silver, our country thrived and prospered with virtually zero inflation and with few exceptions functioned debt free? So what happened to put us into so much debt? The founders, in their wisdom, designed our republic so that its day-to-day -day operations would be funded through indirect excise taxes in the form of duties and tariffs to be paid by foreigners wishing to sell into our markets. This way the people, with their limited government, would remain free of taxation. John Clark Ridpath, writing in his 1910 series, The History of the World, states in Volume 9, the revenues of the United States were swollen to mountainous proportions. The Treasury at Washington became engorged. Harvard professor F. W. Tossig, in his 1931 book, The Tariff History of the United States, wrote, In 1890, the government was embarrassed by a large surplus in the revenue. It appears that there were over $100 million in excess tariff funds in the U.S. Treasury at the end of the 19th century an amount worth billions in today's inflated dollars. And it was during this very same period that Congress's backroom scheming to impose the income tax was taking place. Now ask yourself this simple question. If the Treasury was overflowing with funds, why did the government need any income tax for revenue? The answer is that it didn't. But then again, the raising of revenue was not why the income tax was really introduced, as we shall see shortly. Today, inflation is a way of life, and America isn't just swimming in debt, it's drowning. Consumer credit debt and business loans are at an all-time high. Many state and city governments are nearly broke, and Orange County, California recently declared bankruptcy. Everyone knows that borrowing results in debt, but does anyone know what it is that is actually being borrowed? Is it credit, or is it money? And is there any difference? What exactly is money? A medium of exchange? A store of value? Evidence of credit or debt? Or all of these? Inflation is where each newly printed paper dollar reduces the value of all the others already in circulation. Gold and silver, on the other hand, represent a finite amount of stored value that has been mined and refined through the toil and sweat of human labor and cannot simply be printed into existence as needed. The founders expressly stated their firm desire never to allow a paper currency here in America. According to the records of the Constitutional Convention, the suggestion that the federal government be given the power to emit bills of credit, meaning to issue paper money, was angrily denounced and voted down. The founders' own experience with the then-recent hyperinflation and collapse of the paper continental dollar 
combined with their knowledge of the inflationary history of central governments in England and Europe, had taught them that rulers inevitably resort to the printing press to create as much new money as needed until their inflated paper currencies become worthless. They knew that paper money is artificial money, unlike gold and silver, which are valuable, durable, and limited in supply. Daniel Webster issued the following warning. Of all contrivances for cheating the laboring classes of mankind, none has been more effective than that which deludes them with paper money. John Adams wrote in a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1787. All the perplexities, confusion, and distress in America rise not from defects in their constitution or confederation, not from want of honor or virtue, so much as from downright ignorance of the nature of coin, credit, and circulation. The founders emblazoned their clear understanding of the necessity of a stable commodity money in the form of gold and silver by explicitly stating in the Constitution under Article 1, Section 8, that the federal government may coin money and regulate the value thereof, and under Article 1, Section 10, that the states are forbidden, forbidden to make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. In 1791, President George Washington wrote two letters in which he said that if anyone just two years earlier had predicted the stunningly fast and enormous improvements in the economy brought about by the Gold Clause in the Constitution, it would have been considered a species of madness. So has the wisdom of the founders ultimately prevailed in absolutely preventing paper currency from ever appearing again here in America? The green stuff you'll find in your wallet is commonly and erroneously referred to as dollars. But they are not dollars. A dollar, like a ton, a gallon, or a mile, is a unit of measure. The Free Coinage Act of 1792 specified that United States money be gold or silver coin, with a denomination to be based on weight. A dollar was specifically defined as 25.8 grains of gold, or 412.5 grains of silver. Title 12 of the United States Code at Section 152 states, Lawful money of the United States shall be construed to mean gold and silver coin. So what are those paper bills in your wallet a dollar of? Paper? Due to constant borrowing and inflation, our federal government is now the largest debtor on the planet. But to whom is this debt actually owed? If the government is the actual party that's printing all the money and owes the debt to itself, then why can't it just forgive itself its own debt and cancel it? Now that's a good question, isn't it? Apparently it isn't able to do this, or every sane person in Congress, and there are a few, would be calling for such immediate action. So then who does the government owe the debt to? And why is the Grace Commission discovered, does the income tax go to pay the interest on our debt to the Federal Reserve? The following statement is from President Abraham Lincoln, spoken shortly before his death, and just after the passage of the National Banking Act of 1863. I see in the near future a crisis approaching. It unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. The money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. The money powers prey upon the nation in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. I have two great enemies, the southern army in front of me and the bankers in the rear. Of the two, the one at my rear is my greatest foe. In his 1970 book, Bitter Harvest, author John Steinbacher writes, Seeking in a time of great crisis to develop their money power over the United States, the big international financiers tried to ambush President Lincoln during the dark days of the Civil War, a war which some astute historians claim to have been brought on by the international money powers in order to divide and conquer this nation in the resulting chaos. Federal revenues and expenses then were small, and Lincoln was desperate for money to finance and equip his Union armies in the field. Although hard-pressed by the European money masters, the president would have no part in their scheme to provide the funds in return for interest-bearing U.S. obligations. 
Rather than cave into the bankers' offers to lend the government money at usurious rates of interest, in 1863, President Lincoln caused to be issued $430 million in non-interest-bearing currency. With the credit of the nation behind it, the new money in the form of United States notes was readily accepted by military suppliers. Abraham Lincoln was killed over his insistence that the United States should coin its own money, rather than turn that right over to the international money changers. As author Charles Norburn wrote in his book, Honest Money, The bankers in the nation's hour of need demanded 28% yearly interest. Lincoln would not yield to the bankers' demands. Instead, he persuaded Congress to pass the Act of July 17, 1861, allowing the United States government to print its own notes and pass them into circulation. After issuing debt-free United States notes to become known as Lincoln Greenbacks, and there are still some in circulation today, President Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Upon the death of Abraham Lincoln, Bismarck, then the Chancellor of Germany, made the following comments. There was no man in the United States great enough to wear his boots, and the bankers went anew to grab the riches. I fear that foreign bankers, with their craftiness and torturous tricks, will entirely control the exuberant riches of America and use it to systematically corrupt modern civilization. With Lincoln's assassination, the money changers won one more battle in the war of capturing the money-making machinery of this nation. President Lincoln had said, The privilege of creating and issuing money is the government's greatest creative opportunity, saving the taxpayers immense sums of money. As author Steinbacher also points out, More than 300 million of these Lincoln bills are still in circulation as a medium of exchange for goods and services everywhere. In the hundred years between 1863 and 1963, Lincoln's defiance of the foreign money powers has saved the U.S. taxpayers more than 2.3 billion in simple interest. If instead the interest were calculated at 5% compounded semi-annually, the saving would amount to $49 billion, more than enough to cover the cost of landing Americans on the moon. In 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to then Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Mr. Jefferson also warned, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Now, what did Mr. Jefferson mean when he warned against private banks controlling the issue of our currency? In vetoing the charter of the Second Bank of the United States, President Andrew Jackson addressed Congress with these words. The bold efforts that the present bank has made to control the government and the distress it has wantonly caused are but premonitions of the fate which awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. If the people only understood the rank injustice of our money and banking system, there would be a revolution before morning. In his History of the Great American Fortunes, author Gustav Myers wrote, Under the surface, the Rothschilds long had a powerful influence in dictating American financial laws. The law records show that they were powers in the old Bank of the United States, abolished by Andrew Jackson. President Andrew Jackson resisted every attempt by the international bankers to invade America with their system of debt-based money and usury, and once threw a group of them out of the Oval Office with these very words. You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the grace of the eternal God, I will rout you out. He did so and entirely eradicated the federal debt, creating a large federal surplus of money before his presidency ended. President Jackson also stated, If Congress has the right under the Constitution to issue paper money, it was given to be used by themselves, not to be delegated to individuals or corporations. Do you suppose it would be in the self-interest of the Federal Reserve System to attempt to disparage such a vocal opponent of debt-based paper money as Andrew Jackson. Here's what Roger Johnson wrote about President Jackson in the glossy 1990 booklet, Historical Beginnings of the Federal Reserve, published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. 
Jackson has occasionally been labeled an economic illiterate, and it does appear that he neither understood nor sympathized with the functions of money and banking. The fifth plank of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto states, Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. So do we have a private monopoly bank issuing our currency in America today? Is it possible that our paper currency may have circumvented the Constitution? Pop TV economists typically refer to inflation as too much money chasing too few goods and services, making it sound as though inflation were some mysterious, unavoidable phenomenon that always occurs as an economy expands. But in spite of today's popular wisdom, could inflation actually not be a natural process after all? Could inflation, in fact, be deliberately and knowingly engineered? And if so, by whom? Could this be what Mr. Jefferson meant when he warned against private banks? And how could this have happened in America in spite of the Founders' clear warnings and efforts to prevent it? Perhaps the best explanation of the creation of the Federal Reserve is told by G. Edward Griffin in his book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Griffin relates that on the night of November 22, 1910, a small group of wealthy men escorted by Senator Nelson Aldrich, maternal grandfather of Nelson Rockefeller, left on a late night train ride from a secluded railway siding in Hoboken, New Jersey, with all the windows on the train blacked out to avoid the press. Who were these men? A.P. Andrews, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Frank Vanderlip, President of the National Bank of New York City, Harry P. Davidson, Senior Partner of J.P. Morgan Company, Charles D. Norton, President of Morgan's First National Bank of New York, Benjamin Strong of J.P. Morgan Company, and Paul Warburg, Partner of the Banking House of Kuhn, Loeb & Company of New York. These men represented the world's wealthiest banking interests including European dynasties which had long held private banking control over the creation of money and inflation in their own countries and to this day still control an enormous percentage of the world's wealth. And the destination of this ultra elite group? The private Jekyll Island estate of John D. Rockefeller. And the purpose for their secret journey? To set up a private central bank right here in America to create our money supply for us and then charge us interest just to use it. Frank Vanderlip admitted 25 years after the fact in the February 9th, 1935 issue of the Saturday Evening Post as follows. There was an occasion near the end of 1910 when I was as secretive, indeed as furtive, as any conspirator. Our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. One man on Senator Aldrich's luxurious private railway car perhaps understood this enormously profitable inflationary mechanism better than any other. Sent to America to directly represent the Rothschilds, the powerful European dynasty that virtually owned the Bank of England, Britain's central bank, Paul Warburg emigrated to the U.S. in 1902. He married Nina Loeb, the daughter of Solomon Loeb of Kuhn, Loeb & Company, the most powerful international banking firm in the U.S. at that time, and later became a partner in the firm, working with Nelson Aldrich on banking reform. Baron Rothschild, patriarch of the Rothschild family during the early 1800s, had once commented, Permit me to issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. John Hublin, the first governor of the Bank of England, had revealed the banker's secret when he confessed, we will charge interest on money which we create out of nothing. President James Garfield once stated, Whoever controls the volume of money in any country is master of all its legislation and commerce. Paul Warburg completed his mission. During that 10-day meeting on Jekyll Island, he almost single-handedly wrote the Federal Reserve Act to create the system of debt-based paper money and inflation we have today. Warburg insisted that the name Central Bank be avoided at all costs. It was decided to promote the scheme as a regional reserve system, with initially four and later twelve branches in different sections of the country, knowing full well that the New York branch would dominate the rest, which would be marble white elephants to deceive the public. After the passage of the 1913 Federal Reserve Act, Paul Warburg said in a letter to Colonel House, 
Well, it hasn't quite got everything we want, but the lack can be adjusted later by administrative process. The Federal Reserve System, America's new private central bank, was modeled almost precisely after the Rothschilds Bank of England and Germany's Reichsbank. The central bank which controlled money and credit in Germany and whose principal stockholders were members of the Warburg family. In Billions for the Bankers, Debts for the People, author Sheldon Emery writes, An economic conquest takes place when nations are placed under tribute without the use of visual force, so the victims don't realize that they've been conquered. The conquest begins when the conquerors gain control of the monetary system of the nation. The conquerors do not want to arouse suspicion, so they make gradual changes to their benefit. They slowly usurp the financial assets of a nation. Tribute is collected from them in the form of legal debts and taxes, which the people are led to believe is for their own good. Although this method is much slower than a military conquest, it is longer lasting because the captives do not see any military force used against them. The people are free to participate in the election for their rulers, although the outcome is manipulated by those in control. Without realizing it, a nation is conquered. Their wealth is transferred to their captors, and the conquest is complete. The powerful European families who had backed England's losing military effort during the Revolutionary War would now patiently regain the American colony without firing a single shot. Three years after that still secret meeting, a mere handful of legislators consisting of men like Senator Nelson Aldrich and Congressman Carter Glass of the Jekyll Island crowd rammed Glass's version of the Federal Reserve Act through Congress after the opposition had already gone home for the holidays. As author Debbie Kidd states in her booklet, Why a Bankrupt America? These individuals handed over America's future and our economic system to a handful of private domestic individuals and foreign banking interests. Our founding fathers would have shouted, treason. President Wilson, born in 1856, just 80 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, was a minister's son, a former historian, an educator, and the author of the 1902 work, A History of the American People, in which he extolled Lincoln's debt-free greenbacks. As a presidential candidate, the people trusted when he pledged a money and credit system free from the influence of Wall Street. President Wilson was waiting in the Oval Office for the bill and signed it into law one hour after its passage thereby placing the U.S. into dependent debt slavery to foreign bankers. Senator Charles Lindbergh Sr., father of the famous aviator, and a fierce opponent of the bill, stated after its passage, and I quote, This act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. The invisible government by the money power will now be legalized. The new law will create inflation whenever the trust want inflation, from now on, depressions will be scientifically created. Today, the dollars in your wallet or pocketbook say Federal Reserve Note. But are they really federal? Or could they be privately issued? Are there any actual reserves? And are these bills of credit, to quote the founders, really notes in the legal sense? It may surprise you to learn that the Federal Reserve is not a government agency, but is in fact a private for-profit banking corporation. Skeptical? In a 1921 speech before the Washington Chamber of Commerce, William Harding, governor of the Federal Reserve Board, stated, From a legal standpoint, these banks are private corporations organized under a special act of Congress, namely the Federal Reserve Act. On June 24, 1982, in the case Lewis versus the United States, the Ninth Circuit Court acknowledged this fact. To quote the court, We conclude that the Federal Reserve Banks are not federal, but are independent, privately owned, and locally controlled corporations without day-to-day -day direction from the federal government. In other words, the Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. Federal Reserve Banks are not listed in the Blue Pages section of their local telephone directories, along with government agencies. You'll find them instead in the White Pages, where private businesses are listed. The Federal Reserve takes in approximately one trillion dollars annually, yet due to the special exemption given to them by Congress, pays zero federal income tax. They pay no state income tax either, just property taxes on their buildings, and have never to this day been audited by the General Accounting Office. Why not? Because Congress doesn't have the power to audit them, and they know it. 
As Wright Patman, the ex-chairman of the House Banking Committee, stated in the New York Times on September 14, 1967. In the United States today, we have, in effect, two governments. We have the duly constituted government, then we have an independent, uncontrolled, and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve System, operating the money powers which are reserved to Congress by the Constitution. The Federal Reserve System has never been subjected to a complete independent audit. It refuses to consent to an audit by the General Accounting Office. In July 1996, a Senate Oversight Committee chaired by Alphonse D'Amato examined the Federal Reserve System for the first time, noting a, a few discrepancies, but totally avoiding and ignoring any meaningful examination of the fiat creation of our money. To this very day, the vast majority of the Federal Reserve System's Class A voting stock is still held by the same syndicate of wealthy international banking families that was represented on Jekyll Island back in 1910. So is it any surprise that the proceedings of the Fed are kept secret even from the President and Congress? The Federal Reserve currently buys our paper currency from the U.S. Treasury for approximately 3.8 cents per bill, regardless of denomination. These bills are then backed at full face value by government bonds bearing interest that is paid by, you guessed it, your taxpayer dollars. As for reserves, haven't you always believed that bank loans are made from the savings of former depositors? It may surprise you to learn that through the magic of fractional reserve banking, new loans are literally created out of thin air, merely through the act of recording them as assets on the bank's ledgers. A publication issued by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank called Putting It Simply states, When you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. The booklet titled Modern Money Mechanics, published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, states, Intrinsically, a dollar bill is just a piece of paper. But my personal favorite comes from Art Rolnick chief economist for the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, who when recently asked what the nation's central bank produces, answered, We make money the old-fashioned way. We print it. During testimony before the House Banking and Currency Committee, the following exact conversation took place between Congressman Wright Patman and Mariner Eccles, then chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Mr. Patman asked, Mr. Eccles, how did you get the money to buy these two billion dollars of government bonds? Mr. Eccles answered, we created it. Mr. Patman then asked, out of what? And Mr. Eccles answered, under oath, out of the right to create credit money. A recent publication titled Government Securities, published by the U.S. Bureau of Engraving, states, The Bureau has the power to create money and almost any amount of it. The only limiting factors are the speed of the presses and the public's willingness to accept it. Americans who first learn of this have a hard time comprehending that our total money supply is backed by nothing but debt, and that if all borrowers were to pay back all loans all at once, there would be no money left in existence. In short, all of our money would disappear. Surprised? Robert Hemphill, the credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta, stated it this way, in a foreword to a book entitled 100 percent money by Irving Fisher. If all bank loans were paid there wouldn't be a dollar of coin or currency in circulation. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation. We are absolutely without a permanent money system. What's worse the money to repay the interest charged on a new loan doesn't even exist at the time the loan itself is issued. Such interest can only come into existence through future loans issued to future borrowers. Ex-Congressman McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, stated on June 10, 1932. Some people think the Federal Reserve Banks are U.S. government institutions. They are not. They are private credit monopolies which prey upon the people of the U.S. for the benefit of themselves and their foreign and domestic swindlers and rich and predatory moneylenders. The sack of the United States by the Fed is the greatest crime in history. Mr. McFadden further stated in 1933, Every effort has been made by the Fed to conceal its powers, but the truth is the Fed has usurped government.
It controls everything here, and it controls all our foreign relations. It makes and breaks governments at will. Did they teach you this in government school, maybe even before outcome-based education was introduced? And do you suppose the Wall Street and global bankers, some call them banksters, understand this system? It's probably accurate to say that not one living American in 100,000 has the faintest idea of what you've already learned during this presentation. Today's Federal Reserve note says it is legal tender for all debts, public and private. But can the Federal Reserve note really be a note at all? Black's Law Dictionary defines a note as a promise to pay. But since today's Federal Reserve note is merely evidence of the circulation of debt and promises to pay nothing, it can't very well be an actual note. As Tupper Saucy wrote in The Miracle on Main Street, About all a Federal Reserve note can legally do is wipe out one debt and replace it with itself, another debt, a note that promises nothing. If anything's been paid, the payment occurs only in the minds of the parties. The great modern libertarian Professor Murray Rothbard wrote, The best way to penetrate the mysteries of the modern monetary and banking system is to realize that the government and its central bank act precisely as would a grand counterfeiter. Is it possible then that a mortgage, for example, paid in Federal Reserve notes and considered discharged under the Uniform Commercial Code has actually not been paid at all in the constitutional sense since nothing of lawful substance has been tendered? Since the Federal Reserve note is lent into circulation by a private for-profit banking cartel and not spent into circulation by our duly constituted government, could it be that generations of American taxpayers since 1913 have actually paid trillions of dollars in interest on the federal debt to international bankers? Could it also be that all the goods and property purchased in the U.S. since 1913 with these privately issued notes are actually just collateral to this international banking dynasty? The Federal Reserve System, the private issuers and owners of our money supply, take what started out as rag linen paper, feed it through a printing press, and then lend this stationery into existence in the form of home mortgage or business loans. The banks charge daily compound interest on these loans such that over the course of 30 years, in the case of a typical mortgage, the amount of the original loan will be repaid three times over. If your monthly mortgage payment is $1,000 with $950 in interest charges and just $50 going to repay principal, then you have just spent $950 in one month to rent the use of just $50. When the bank forecloses upon the hapless owner who cannot make the principal payments plus usury, it takes into its possession a real tangible asset that has literally been converted into real worth out of nothing but a ledger entry. Now multiply this by the trillions of dollars loaned to billions of borrowers by central banks worldwide for centuries, and you have some idea of who really runs most of the world. Such wealth, incomprehensible to the average person, makes billionaire Bill Gates look like a third grader with a lemonade stand. So have we experienced the inflationary devaluation of our currency that the Founding Fathers and so many others so vehemently warned against? Kenneth Gerbino, former chairman of the American Economic Council, stated, Historically, the United States has been a hard money country. Only since 1913 has the United States operated on a fiat money system. During this period, paper money has depreciated over 87%. During the preceding 140-year period, the hard currency of the United States had actually maintained its value. Wholesale prices in 1913 were the same as in 1787. Quoting again from The Creature from Jekyll Island, author G. Edward Griffin writes, Inflation has now been institutionalized at a fairly constant 5% per year. This has been scientifically determined to be the optimum level for generating the most revenue without causing public alarm. A 5% devaluation applies not only to the money earned this year, but to all that is left over from previous years. At the end of the first year, a dollar is worth 95 cents. At the end of the second year, the 95 cents is reduced again by 5%, leaving its worth at 90 cents and so on. By the time a person has worked 20 years, the government will have confiscated 64% of every dollar he saved over those years. By the time he has worked 45 years, 
the hidden tax will be 90%. The government will take virtually everything a person saves over a lifetime. In 1920, at the conclusion of World War I, noted economist John Maynard Keynes stated in his book The Economic Consequences of the Peace. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of their citizens. There is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. Today's Federal Reserve note will purchase less than 10 cents of what it would buy as recently as 1940. Have you ever stopped to think that this massive inflation has literally stolen trillions of dollars of America's wealth and productivity over the course of just a few generations? And that it may well be the most insidious tax ever collected? On November 23, 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt wrote in a letter to Colonel Edward Mandel House, known to have been President Wilson's most intimate and influential advisor. The real truth of the matter is, and you and I know, that a financial element in the large centers has owned the government of the U.S. since the days of Andrew Jackson. History depicts Andrew Jackson as the last truly honorable and incorruptible American president. Upon signing the Federal Reserve Act into law, President Wilson stated, I cannot say with what deep emotions of gratitude I feel that I have had a part in completing a work which I think will be of lasting benefit to the business of the country. Of course, President Wilson had also confessed on a prior occasion, Our system of credit is concentrated in the hands of a few men, a power so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that we had better not speak above our breath when we speak in condemnation of it. We have come to be completely controlled by small groups of dominant men. In 1924, just 11 years after signing the Federal Reserve Act, President Wilson said on his deathbed that he had betrayed his nation. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, stated, with reference to the act, it is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. The one aim of these financiers is world control by the creation of inextinguishable debts. Forty-four years later, Senator George Malone of Nevada echoed those remarks when he stated before Congress in 1957. I believe that if the people of this nation fully understood what Congress has done to them over the past 49 years, they would move on Washington. It adds up to a preconceived plan to destroy the economic and social independence of the United States. For most of its early years, America thrived and prospered, not only with virtually zero inflation, but with zero income taxes either. Ron Paul, former member of Congress, stated, It probably is not necessary for the government to tax anyone directly. It could simply print the money it needs. However, that would be too bold a stroke, for then it would be obvious to all what kind of counterfeiting operation the government is running. The present system, combining taxation and inflation, is akin to watering the milk. Too much water, and the people catch on. If, as the Grace Commission reported, income taxes do not finance government functions, then what is the real reason for the income tax? Why do we still pay it? Considering that the very same cartel in Congress passed the 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Act, and the Federal Reserve Act, all in 1913, could there be a hidden connection between the imposition of the income tax and the imposition of inflationary central banking? In short, could there have been collusion amongst these insiders to guarantee that the income tax would lock in the interest payments on the massive debt they knew their central bank would create? In 1946, Beardsley Rummel was the chairman of the powerful New York branch of the Federal Reserve System, the dominant branch and for all practical purposes, the Fed itself. As the man who during World War II had personally designed the Rummel pay-as-you-go system of tax withholding we have today, he was certainly familiar with the true nature and purpose of the federal income tax. In an astonishing paper titled, Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete, read before the American Bar Association and published 
in the January 1946 issue of American Affairs. He stated that two of the purposes for the income tax were to stabilize the purchasing power of the dollar and to express public policy in the distribution of wealth and income. In the introduction to Mr. Rummel's article, the magazine's editor offered the following summary of the chairman's views. His thesis is that given control of a central banking system, such as the Federal Reserve, and an inconvertible currency, one not backed by gold, a sovereign national government, such as the United States, is finally free of money worries and needs no longer levy taxes for the purpose of providing itself with revenue. All taxation, therefore, should be regarded from the point of view of social and economic consequences. Chairman Rummel revealed in his article, the most important single purpose to be served by the imposition of federal taxes is the maintenance of a dollar which has stable purchasing power over the years. Without the use of federal taxation, all other means of stabilization of inflation are unavailing. The dollars the government takes by taxes cannot be spent by the people and therefore can no longer be used to acquire the things which are available for sale. Taxation is, therefore, an instrument of the first importance in the administration of any fiscal and monetary policy. He also stated in that same article, The second principal purpose of federal taxes is to attain more equality of wealth and of income than would result from economic forces working alone. Mr. Rummel was admitting, in writing, that the true hidden purpose of the income tax is to hold down or stabilize inflation and guarantee socialistic wealth redistribution. So there you have it, the truth behind the income tax. The income tax never did have anything to do with the raising of revenue. So what does it do? It merely siphons off excess paper from circulation to prevent inflation or even hyperinflation that is caused when the government creates too much paper out of thin air. The income tax protects the unbacked Federal Reserve paper currency by inhibiting the inflationary effect of ravenous government spending. By transferring purchasing power from the people to the government, the income tax offers a safety valve through which inflationary spending can be released. By siphoning excess dollars from the money supply through progressive taxation, the hyperinflation that would ordinarily result from fractional reserve banking can be masked. So far we've examined the form of government we have and we've learned that while most people think we have a democracy, we don't. We've also learned that money is not necessarily what it appears to be. Like the tip of the iceberg where most of the mass remains hidden beneath the surface, the vast majority of our money supply is in fact computer credit floating through telephone lines. The green paper money in your wallet is actually just the visible tip of the total money supply controlled by the Fed. Americans today are awakening to the realization that paper money, while perhaps in some ways convenient, is in fact used to centralize wealth in the hands of those who control its supply and is destructive of true liberty. Since paper money necessitates an income tax in order to prevent hyperinflation, we need to examine the method that's used to siphon off this excess paper. And as you may have guessed by now, the income tax is not what it appears to be. To understand how the income tax is applied, we need to look at the legal authority of the IRS to tax U.S. citizens living and working within the 50 states. Keep in mind that the Constitution protects the rights of these citizens, therefore the Internal Revenue Code must be written in such a way as to remain constitutional. All United States laws written by Congress are codified into 50 titles of law, each covering a different category of laws relating to education, the military, banking, and so forth. These 50 titles encompass what is known as the United States Code, abbreviated as USC, and can be read by the public at any law library. Title 26 comprises the entire Internal Revenue Code. Many tax professionals and even tax attorneys mistakenly view the Internal Revenue Code as a series of code sections that run from beginning to end much like a telephone directory. That is totally inaccurate. The Internal Revenue Code is not applied generally and one cannot comprehend the code 
without first having a clear understanding of its structure and subdivision. The code currently consists of 100 chapters comprising 9,806 code sections compartmentalized as of this year into 11 subtitles. The first five subtitles, A through E, each cover distinctly different categories of tax. Subtitle A is the income tax. Subtitle B is estate and gift taxes. Subtitle C, the employment tax. Subtitle D is miscellaneous excise taxes. Subtitle E is alcohol, tobacco, and certain other excise taxes. Subtitle F is procedure and administration, which includes the definitions of various legal terms as used within the code. Subtitles G through K cover miscellaneous topics, such as the financing of presidential election campaigns, etc. Each subtitle is a totally distinct and separate body of law unto itself. The application of each subtitle is found to be confined within its respective chapters, meaning that the liability and enforcement provisions confined within one subtitle do not extend to the enforcement of law in some other subtitle. Under the law, for one to become liable for the payment of any given tax, one must first be made legally subject to that tax. In other words, the tax must first be imposed by Congress, and the liability for the tax must arise from a specific written statute as expressed by the intent of the legislature. So if, for example, you're involved in the manufacture of alcohol, you become the subject of the excise tax on the privilege of being associated with that activity and are thereby made liable for the payment of the alcohol tax. The same is true with regards to the manufacture of tobacco products. Perhaps you've seen the excise tax stamps on a package of cigarettes or on a bottle of liquor. However, if you are not involved in either of the activities, you are not liable for the payment of the tax associated with them. Just imagine if you were to receive a letter from the IRS claiming that you failed to file a return to report the number of bottles of whiskey you had just manufactured and demanding payment from you of $20,000 in unpaid alcohol excise tax. Would you immediately begin arguing the amount of the bill? Wouldn't you instead protest that they were writing to the wrong person and that you had never been involved in that activity and therefore could not possibly owe a penny of alcohol tax, let alone what the IRS claimed you owed? Well, what about income taxes? What about employment taxes? If you're like most Americans, you've probably always assumed that you had a liability to pay those taxes. But then you also assumed that you lived in a democracy. And you've also assumed that the government, not a private banking cartel, controls the supply of money in circulation. The only code section in all of Subtitle A that makes anyone liable to pay a tax on income is Code Section 1461, which states, Every person required to deduct and withhold any tax under this chapter is hereby made liable for such tax. Well, who is this any person that Congress made liable to deduct and withhold? Code Section 7701A16 defines this person as the withholding agent who is required to deduct and withhold any tax under the provisions of Sections 1441, 1442, and 1443. So we look up those code sections and we see that Code Section 1441 applies to non-resident aliens, Code Section 1442 applies to foreign corporations, and Code Section 1443 applies to certain foreign tax-exempt organizations. It's important to understand that while the withholding agent may be required to file a return on behalf of his non-resident alien principal, he's not required to file a return to report his own income earned within the 50 states. The astonishing truth is that Subtitle A imposes the liability for the payment of income taxes on the income of foreigners and certain U.S. citizens working in a foreign country under a current tax treaty with the United States and earning over the $70,000 annual exclusion. There is no code section in all of Subtitle A or anywhere else in the entire Internal Revenue Code, for that matter, that makes the United States citizen earning his or her living exclusively within the 50 states of the Union liable for the tax that is imposed on income under Subtitle A, period. With today's computers that can hold the entire Internal Revenue Code on a single CD-ROM, 
It's a very simple matter to search in a matter of seconds for any and all occurrences of such words as citizen and income throughout the entire Internal Revenue Code, let alone just in Subtitle A. And sure enough, the code section imposing a liability on a U.S. citizen or the tax on income when working within the 50 states of the Union is just not there. As further proof, the index for the Internal Revenue Code has no listing for the liability of citizens unless that income is from the insular island possessions. So why is the income tax so limited in its application? Why is the income of citizens living and working within the 50 states not subject to the income tax? Well, under the Constitution, Congress can impose two and only two different classes of taxes, direct taxes and indirect taxes. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution states, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 states, No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration hereinbefore directed to be taken. Americans are a highly mobile society, so some states could lose population over time while other states gained it. That's why there's a national census every 10 years to count noses, to determine both the number of representatives to be elected from each state and the proportionate share of each state's direct tax burden should Congress decide to impose a direct tax. Under direct taxation, Congress cannot directly tax a U.S. citizen. Direct taxes must be imposed according to census and enumeration upon the states of the Union only to be collected within their respective borders from their own state citizens according to the limitations imposed by their own state constitutions. There are currently 435 representatives in the House of Representatives. If, for example, Congress decided to pass a direct tax to raise, say, $435 million, the governor of a state with 10 representatives would receive a bill from Congress for 10 435ths of that $435 million, or $10 million. The only other type of tax Congress can impose is an indirect tax which under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 of the Constitution states, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Two examples of constitutionally uniform excise taxes are the federal excise tax you pay on each gallon of gasoline you pump and on each long-distance telephone call you make, regardless of which of the 50 states you're in. Keep in mind that all indirect taxes are avoidable in nature. If you don't want to pay the tax, don't participate in the activity associated with the tax. For example, to avoid the federal excise tax on gasoline, don't pump gas, ride a bike instead. To avoid the federal excise tax on long distance telephone service, write a letter. Direct taxes, however, are not avoidable. Now let's try to determine the nature of the taxes you've been paying each April 15th to the IRS. Are they direct or indirect? Keep in mind that an income tax is not a tax on you as a person. It's a tax on income. Income is inanimate. It cannot reach into its own pocket to pay the tax on itself. Someone has to be made liable for its payment. The question is, who is made liable? Well, we've already seen who's made liable, the withholding agent. And who is he required to withhold from? those whose income is subject to the tax. And who is that? Foreigners. And why is that? Because the property of foreigners is not protected by the Constitution. The Supreme Court ruled in the 1920 case Eisner versus McCumber that income may be defined as the gain derived from capital, from labor, or from both combined. In the case Stapler versus U.S., the High Court ruled that income is not a wage or compensation for any type of labor. In Doyle versus Mitchell Brothers, the High Court ruled, Whatever difficulty there may be about a precise and scientific definition of income, it imports something entirely distinct from principal or capital, either as a subject of taxation or as a measure of the tax, conveying rather the idea of gain or increase arising from corporate activities we must reject the broad contention that all receipts, everything that comes in, are income. 
In Connor versus the United States, the High Court ruled, If there is no gain, there is no income. Congress has taxed income, not compensation. In 1894, Congress tried to get away with imposing a direct tax on the property of U.S. citizens by passing the Income Tax Act of 1894. On May 20th, 1895, in their decision in Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust Company, the Supreme Court rejected this tax since it violated the constitutional requirement of apportionment among the states. To quote the High Court in Pollock, the Constitution prohibits any direct tax unless in proportion to numbers is ascertained by the census and prohibits Congress from laying a direct tax on the revenue from property of the citizen without regard to state lines. We are of the opinion that taxes on personal property being a direct tax, the income of personal property are likewise direct taxes. Those same Jekyll Island insiders passed both the 16th Amendment and the Income Tax Act of 1913 in that same year to lay the groundwork for the imposition of income tax, which, as we've seen, never did have anything to do with the raising of revenue and has technically never been applied against the income of U.S. citizens working within the 50 states. The income tax inevitably was collected to guarantee the international bankers the interest on the national debt that would inevitably result after the passage of the Federal Reserve Act in December of that same year. The 16th Amendment, which became part of the Constitution on February 25, 1913, is the so-called Income Tax Amendment, which states, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived, without apportionment among the several states, and without regard to any census or enumeration. To this very day, a nationwide chorus of politicians, TV economists, and law school professors alike all chime in unison that the 16th Amendment authorized the imposition of an income tax on ordinary U.S. citizens, and they are all mistaken. The 16th Amendment did not amend or change the U.S. Constitution, but please don't just take my word for it. The Supreme Court itself in January 1916 ruled in Bruce Schaber versus Union Pacific Railroad. The proposition and the contentions under the 16th Amendment would cause one provision of the Constitution to destroy another. That is, they would result in bringing the provisions of the amendment exempting a direct tax from apportionment into irreconcilable conflict with the general requirement that all direct taxes be apportioned. The result, instead of simplifying the situation and making clear the limitations of the taxing power, which obviously the amendment must have intended to accomplish, would create radical and destructive changes in our constitutional system and multiply confusion. The 16th Amendment, as correctly interpreted, is limited to indirect taxes, and for that reason is constitutional. In the case Stanton versus Baltic Mining, also decided in 1916, the High Court stated that the 16th Amendment conferred, and I quote, no new power of taxation. Imagine that, the highest court in the land stating, in plain English, for everyone to read, including the IRS, that the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation. So the so-called income tax amendment that everybody and their uncle believes authorized the income tax, and that many patriotic Americans still object to since there is overwhelming evidence that it was never properly ratified by the states, changed absolutely nothing. The 16th Amendment was constitutional window dressing and might as well have never been written. The fact that the 16th Amendment did not change one word or phrase in the Constitution has for years been one of the U.S. government's best kept secrets. Many college professors in our nation's most prestigious institutions still teach that the income tax is neither a direct nor an indirect tax, but is a hybrid tax that falls somewhere between the two. Such a gross lack of understanding by those charged with teaching the law to future lawyers is, in my opinion, unpardonable. Thwarted by both the Bruce Schaber and Stanton decisions, the Department of the Treasury issued Treasury Decision Number 2313 on March 21, 1916. Here are a few excerpted quotes from TD 2313 in reference to the Bruce Schaber decision. 
It is hereby held that income accruing to non-resident aliens in the form of interest and dividends is subject to the income tax imposed by the Act of October 3, 1913. The responsible heads, agents, or representatives of non-resident aliens shall make a full and complete return of the income therefrom on Form 1040. The Treasury Department has stated that you are to file Form 1040 on behalf of your non-resident alien principal. So don't forget to do that next April 15th. Of course, since you'll be signing Form 1040 under penalties of perjury and stating that every material fact is 100% correct to the best of your knowledge, and since the commission of perjury is a felony that attaches criminal fines and penalties, be sure you really are filing Form 1040 on behalf of your non-resident alien principal. The chances are pretty good that you never knew that. But then again, you never knew that we don't live in a democracy that neither you nor your government has any control over the money supply, that the income tax has nothing to do with raising revenue, and that you have most likely never paid the income tax in your entire life. We have to ask ourselves a question at this point. Do we see a pattern developing here? <laughs> Is it possible that this information has been deliberately withheld from the general public? And if so, why? Now you can begin to understand what your lifetime of voluntary compliance really means and how important it is to the IRS. Remember section 1111.1 of the Internal Revenue Manual which we showed you earlier? The mission of the service is to encourage and achieve the highest possible degree of voluntary compliance with the tax laws. If what we've said is true, then one would expect employers to be told somewhere that they are not required to withhold from U.S. citizen employees. Keep in mind that the only requirement for withholding is from foreign or non-resident alien type individuals. And indeed, if we read IRS publication 515, we find a statement the IRS hopes you never see. Under the main heading, Withholding Exemptions and Reductions, and within the paragraph titled Evidence of Residence, the IRS states the following in speaking to the payer of income. If an individual gives you a written statement stating that he or she is a citizen or resident of the United States and you do not know otherwise, you do not have to withhold tax. And what is the statement of citizenship? It's simply an affidavit notarized and signed under penalties of perjury stating that I, John Doe, am a citizen of the United States. It's just that simple. So the bottom line is that according to the IRS, if you are a citizen or resident of the United States, the payer of your income does not have to withhold tax. Imagine that. Now ask yourself this question. If a United States citizen ever really were liable for tax withholding, why would the IRS ever have printed this statement anywhere? Why would it even exist in writing? 26 Code of Federal Regulations 1.1441-5, paragraph C, states, The duplicate copy of each statement and form filed pursuant to this section shall be forwarded with a letter of transmittal to Internal Revenue Service Center, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19255. The original statement shall be retained by the withholding agent. If the citizen within the States of the Union stops filing Form 1040, the IRS will occasionally start a criminal investigation. With what you have learned so far, you can understand that the IRS computer would not recognize the validity of a criminal investigation against a citizen working exclusively within the 50 states. In fact, the IRS Internal Revenue Manual, Chapter 1100, titled Organization and Staffing, states in Section 1132.75, the Criminal Investigation Division enforces the criminal statute applicable to income, estate, gift, employment, and excise tax laws involving United States citizens residing in foreign countries and non-resident aliens subject to federal income tax filing requirements. There's no mention of the U.S. citizen residing within the 50 states, is there? Why? Because the income of citizens living and working within the 50 states is not the subject of the tax. Of course, that wouldn't stop the IRS from investigating you, now would it? Remember, the S in IRS stands for service. We warned you before you began viewing this videotape that it could affect 
your peace of mind. But you wouldn't listen. You had to go right ahead and watch this video. Now you have to make a decision. Are you going to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution? So what is the solution to everything you've just learned? Is it to stop filing returns as the IRS itself has recently admitted is now reaching near epidemic proportion? Well, if the law does not require you to file, and you know that for a fact, then there's no reason to file. However, the only one who can make that determination is you. And you can't base that determination on the superficial information you've been exposed to on this tape. The purpose of this introductory tape is merely to break some of the rust free on our metal gears. To get us to think for ourselves, we need to educate ourselves. Remember what the Supreme Court said in U.S. versus Minker? Because of what appears to be a lawful command on the surface, many citizens, because of their respect for what appears to be law, are cunningly coerced into waiving their rights due to ignorance. Fortunately, ignorance is not terminal. You, as an individual, merely need to educate yourself if indeed you want to assert your rights. The good news is that the research has already been done, and the education is readily available. There's a fellowship in Westminster, Maryland called the Safe a Patriot Fellowship. Membership in this association is an investment in honest government and liberty. The fellowship is a national organization of individuals who are aware that various government agencies are regularly and systematically infringing upon individual rights. In general, members are also aware that this infringement is often a direct result of inadequately trained government employees who are more concerned with pushing buttons and adhering to administrative policies and procedures rather than to the law itself, and that such policy often runs counter to the constitutional limitations that are imposed on the government. When someone joins the fellowship, it is a foregone conclusion that they are, to whatever extent, fed up with the government bureaucracy that has brought this about, and are particularly concerned with the IRS and its propensity to misapply the law and to illegally enforce its provisions to the detriment of all concerned. This particular agency gets away with its illegal actions because most people do not take the time to educate themselves or to prepare a proper legal defense. When someone joins the fellowship, it is assumed that they have studied the Internal Revenue Code and have determined that their activities are not the subject of the tax under Title 26 and that the law does not require them to file an income tax return or to pay the income tax. The purpose of the fellowship is to provide the means for members to assert their rights by giving aid, support, and assistance to fellow members who wish to do so. This is accomplished in a number of ways. First, the fellowship operates much like an insurance company in that members pledge to assist other members should they suffer a loss of property as a result of illegal IRS collection practices. Such member assistance program payments currently average fifteen to twenty dollars per member per month. A detailed explanation of how this mutual assistance program works can be found in the fellowship program agreement. Second, the fellowship provides educational material to show what the law actually says and to attempt to clarify the limitations of various tax laws as intended by Congress. The fellowship publishes a bi-monthly members-only newsletter called Reasonable Action, a masterpiece of legal analysis and commentary regarding the tax laws and regulations that represents the most accurate information currently available in written form, as well as numerous insightful articles dealing with other issues of concern to members. Third, the fellowship provides assistance via its paralegal and case development departments. In the last five years, the fellowship has generated, tracked, or maintained an estimated five million documents written under power of attorney on behalf of its members in response to improper allegations made by the IRS. All IRS letters must be responded to or their allegations are presumed to be correct. Fellowship casework is performed to preserve rights to property and due process that the member may not even know he or she has. In other words, the fellowship argues the law so that an individual member is not cunningly coerced into inadvertently waiving his or her rights 
due to ignorance. Also, if the IRS attempts to move forward with an improper lien or illegal collection action, paralegals are available to assist. The fellowship has no disagreement with the written law whatsoever. Since it does not protest or object to any tax, income or otherwise, it is not a tax protest organization. Since 1984, the fellowship has published a flyer which states 28 indisputable facts of law to show that a U.S. citizen living and working in the 50 states was never made liable for the income tax and offers a $10,000 cash reward to anyone who can refute these facts. To date, not one person has been able to successfully challenge this information. Not one member of Congress, not one federal judge, not one lawyer, not even an IRS agent has been able to collect the $10,000 reward. Perhaps your accountant or tax preparer would like to try. If you'd like to read this flyer for yourself, give the independent representative whose name and phone number are shown on the label of this tape a call and you'll be mailed or faxed one. The Fellowship is a First Amendment association dedicated to confining IRS and other government personnel within the written law. The association recognizes the necessity of taxation for the government to raise revenues in the constitutional sense, but also recognizes that this necessity has provisions in the law, and that the government in meeting its exigencies may not extend its activities beyond the law which is specifically limited in its application. The fellowship educates the public and actively promotes the study of the law and the assertion of one's rights in accordance with the law. Our only product is the truth and we put it to good use. The fellowship was founded to disarm the IRS of its only actual weapon, fear. Think of it this way. A single pencil is easy to snap with your bare hands, but a bundle of pencils is not. By standing together, Fellowship members can force bureaucrats back within the confines of the law and arrest America's wild rush toward perpetual debt and a totalitarian socialist government. As the Supreme Court stated in the case American Communication Association versus Dowds, It is not the function of our government to keep the citizen from falling into error. It is the function of the citizen to keep the government from falling into error. It's regrettable that in a free country, private citizens need any such nationwide neighborhood crime watch organization as a Saver Patriot Fellowship to force the government to stay within the bounds of its legal authority. But unfortunately, we do. Full-time fellowship staffers include receptionists, caseworkers, paralegals, editors, printers, and numerous others. As an exam-certified independent representative for the Saver Patriot Fellowship, I can tell you from personal experience that just being at their Maryland-based national headquarters and witnessing one day's activities was one of the most centering and uplifting experiences I've ever had. As you turn off the main street in downtown Westminster and onto Carroll Street, you immediately spot the building on the right with the sign Save a Patriot Fellowship displayed prominently over the door. As you walk past a parking lot packed with staff vehicles and open the front door, you are greeted by the receptionist. As you walk through the sprawling facility, you will see numerous workspaces manned by two dozen full and part-time caseworkers and paralegals, a large lecture hall where regular Saturday night presentations are held for the public, a television studio, and even a print shop. You might find it interesting to note that the fellowship's fiduciary, John Kottmeyer, does not withhold from the pay of any of the staff. The IRS has never attempted to get John to do so. The Fellowship is a thriving, vital hub of activity, educating and supporting the rights of its patriotic members in every state of the Union. Call Save the Patriot Fellowship today at 876-6342. That's where liberty comes first. Save the Patriot Fellowship, 876-6342. Prospective members are frequently surprised to learn that the fellowship has long-standing members in nearly every department of the federal government, including every branch of the armed services. I mention that since there are many good people who work for our government. For some, public service was a calling to make positive changes in our American way of life. It's the small percentage 
of power-seeking individuals at the top of the federal bureaucracy who misuse their command over enormous budgets and virtual armies of workers to administer public policy, trample on the Constitution, and violate the rule of law. Remember, we have the greatest government on the face of the earth, but it's only as good as those who administer the law. When bureaucrats take it upon themselves to violate the law or to deceive the public as to the intent of the law, then we the people have the duty to sound an alarm and fix whatever's gone wrong. Can a society be truly free if the government has the right to take your personal property? No. No. Can you be free if the government takes your personal property? No. 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 Yeah, it's not possible. If you're going to take it away, you, you know, it's not right. It's not free. No. Uh, no. I, I wouldn't think so. No. No, I don't think so. No, it can't be free at all because one never knows what to expect next. If we have to obey the law, should our government also have to obey the law? Yes, they should. Of course. Yeah, that's a given in our society. Most definitely. There, there does seem to be a double standard, though, today. Well, if you and I have to obey the law, shouldn't our government also obey the law? They should have to. We have a, a long cultural tradition. Yeah. We have a long cultural tradition of, of um, uh, limiting the rights of, of government over the citizenry. The de facto fact of the matter is that it's completely unlimited and out of control. Become a very big bureaucracy. Why'd they do that? Democracy? Democracy. Democracy. Democracy is simply majority rule. What was what the founding fathers called a mobocracy. The individual freedoms that uh, working men and women uh, had enjoyed and, and were hoping that that would be secured by the uh, by the Constitution and Bill of Rights it seems to be rapidly fleeing. It shouldn't be that way. The flaw is I really don't have rights. My rights have been um, misused and um, abused, ignored. I believe that uh, the original intent of the Constitution and the, the intent of, a, of the forefathers have been misinterpreted over a period of time and we are rapidly heading towards a form of socialism. Who was the last time I said the pledge? Hmm. When's the last time I said the Pledge of Allegiance? Most of what's going on today was never even a consideration by the forefathers. It's uh, really gotten out of hand. We have reached a crossroad in our history where the people now have to make some decisions. And before we can make those decisions, we first need accurate information. This is very important if we are to start down the road toward restoring the rule of law and honesty in our government and creating a more just society. One of the ways you can get that information is to contact the independent representative whose name and phone number are displayed on the label of this tape and obtain the fellowship's video library that delves into great detail into the things we have just scratched on the surface of this tape. The fellowship recently released a groundbreaking 12-hour video seminar titled Just the Facts. Unfortunately, for the IRS that is, this masterpiece of legal research uses plain English and reproductions of the actual law to painstakingly detail the history of the fraudulent imposition of the income tax as well as the actual step-by-step -step technical procedures the IRS uses to ignore and violate the law when imposing taxes, placing liens, and seizing property. After nine months in production and editing with state-of-the-art computer production equipment, this outstanding video lecture is now available for the use of patriotic Americans in thoroughly understanding the tax laws of the United States as well as their proper and limited application. It is undeniably the most comprehensive, accurate source of information in the constitutional movement with regard to taxes. Hundreds of animations and dazzling special effects make this 12-hour presentation divided into six two-hour tapes, not only enlightening, but entertaining. In 1776, most colonists wanted no part of forming a new nation. By various estimates, as many as 97% of those residing in the original colonies were either fearful indifferent bystanders or outright British sympathizers. In other words, as few as 3% of the population at that time supported the revolution that led to the forming of America. In that era, before electricity, 
before the humming of window fans and central heating. When Paul Revere rode thundering and shouting through the night, it was dead quiet. It's for certain that he woke up most of the residents, most of whom simply turned over and went back to sleep. A few, however, grabbed their muskets with one hand and their pants with the other and ran down to the green to confront the British Army. These patriots fired the shot heard round the world and began what was to become the American Revolution. Samuel Clemens, writing under the pen name of Mark Twain, once observed, In the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man, brave, hated, and scorned. When his cause succeeds, however, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. In 1777, John Adams said, Posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. You can enslave someone who is willing to exchange a benefit for their liberty. Consider carefully these words of Samuel Adams. If ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that ye were our countrymen. For more information about obtaining the Fellowship's video library or joining as a member, please call the independent representative whose name and telephone number appear on the label of this tape. And thank you for listening.